I try to uh, take fewer antibiotics if possible. Um, I, I'm careful about how I do that. Um, uh, I think the one lesson that can be learned is that fiber is always good. I think you can always eat more fiber. You know, I think your grandmother was right. Leafy greens are, are good for you. So eat as, eat as much of your leafy greens and your fruits and vegetables as possible. I'm going to introduce our speaker. Um, our speaker tonight is Dr. Sean Gibbons, and he's received his PhD in biophysical sciences from the University of Chicago in 2015. His graduate work focused on using microbial communities as empirical models for testing ecological theory. He completed his postdoctoral training in Eric Alm's lab at the Department of Biological Engineering at MIT from 2015 to 2018. His postdoctoral work focused on eco-evolutionary dynamics within the gut, the human gut microbiome. Gibbons recently joined the faculty at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, and he'll be moving very shortly, so you're lucky you caught him while he's still here. Today I'm going to talk about the human gut microbiome, um, but before I get into the details of my talk, I wanted to take some unbiased data from, from the audience. So I'm going to do a little bit of a participation thing. We have a kind of a small number crowd here, so we'll see whether the statistics work out. But uh, before I paint your perception with uh, what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to, I'm going to take these numbers down. So please feel free to, to not participate if you don't feel comfortable. But I'm going to ask two questions, essentially. The first question is whether you were vaginally born or whether you were born via C-section. And the second question is whether or not you experience allergies uh, or not. And, and by that, I'm going to say you know, if you've been diagnosed with allergies by the doctor or if you've taken medication for allergies, if you carry an EpiPen, uh, those are all in the yes category for allergies. But if you just have the sniffles every now and then you suspect that maybe you have hay fever in the spring, maybe not so much allergies, right? So if you actually have taken drugs for allergies, um, that'll, be, that'll be the question. So I'm going I'm to record your answers and I'm going to the, ask these questions in, in pairs. So first off, raise your hand if you were born naturally, vaginally born, and you have allergies. One. In the back? Oh, another one in the back? All right, two, two. Great. Oh, more data. Okay, next question. If you were naturally born, vaginally born, and you have no allergies, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, looks like seventeen, eighteen, eighteen. Wow. Okay, okay, this is starting to look significant. All right, if you were born via C section and you have allergies, please raise your hand. One. Anyone else? Okay, just one. So, you know, it's more rare to be born via C-section. Uh, and if you have no allergies or were born via cesarean section, uh, one, two, three, four, four. All right, all right. So we're going to keep that uh, little survey in our pocket, and we'll come back to it later uh, and see what the significance of it is. Okay, so back, back to the microbiome. Uh, so essentially, uh, every, whether you like it or not, every surface around you uh, on the entire planet is covered in a patina of microorganisms. Um, they're just everywhere. They're embedded in everything, including our own bodies. Uh, and we, ha as multicellular organisms, throughout the course of our evolution, have had to deal with this fact. You know, you either have to beat them or you have to join them. Um, you're at, we're at a sort of evolutionary detente with these things. We're, we're big walking happy meals for all these bacteria, and so we have to somehow evolve ways to either cooperate with them or kill them. Uh, and so this is essentially the, the, the field of the microbiome is understanding this handshake between this complex ecology of microorganisms that lives in and on our bodies and our own, our own bodies. Uh, so essentially, we are born sterile. So in the womb, we don't have microbes in our guts, on our skin, in our mouths. Uh, so we come out sterile, but we're very quickly inundated with, with microbes um, via our mother's vagina or the skin of our parents or any other environmental exposures. We encounter this huge horde, this host of microbes. And this picture looks kind of menacing. I, I love this New Yorker cartoon. Um, but hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll see this cloud of microbes less, as, menace, as less menacing and more as an embrace. So a very small number of these things are, are probably actually dangerous to this baby. The vast majority of these microbes are either completely benign or actually essential for the health of these people, of, of people. Okay. So you're born sterile, you get quickly inoculated. 
Uh, and by the numbers, we can look at how many cells are in our bodies, how many of those cells are microbial versus how many of those cells are human. Um, this is a little bit of an outdated plot from the American Museum of Natural History. Um, back in the day, we kind of thought there was about one human cell for every 10 bacterial cells in our bodies. It's about a one to 10. Um, that was based on some papers from the 1970s. More modern estimates put us at about 50-50. So for every human cell in our bodies, there is a microbial cell. So we're, we're about equal. And that can change depending on your last bowel movement. So you may be uh, you know, more bacteria just prior and more human just after. Uh, but this next plot hasn't changed with the updates. Uh, this is just essentially so showing the genetic diversity of our bodies. If you look at the human genome, we have something like 23,000 genes in the human genome. But if you look at all the genomes of the bacteria in our microbiome, there's something more like two to three million genes. So the amount of genetic potential the amount of functionality that is bound up in that microbial matter is, is much, much larger than we can encode in our own genomes. Uh, and these organisms are not randomly distributed across our bodies. There are very distinct environments, kind of like the savanna or, the, or a rainforest or, or the desert. You have a more dry, arid skin environment that's uh, populated by things like Staphylococcus, um, Cornobacterium. In the mouth, you have some streptococcus. Uh, in the gut, you have a lot of strict anaerobes, like your bacteroidetes and your firmicutes, your clostridia. Uh, and in the um, vaginal tract, you have things like lactobacillus, sort of acid tolerant organisms. Um, so it's, th these environments are incredibly distinct and incredibly different. Uh, and we are we're sort of filtering from the environment all these organisms we're exposed to and, and just selecting for a very small number of them to actually persist and live on certain parts of our bodies. And so if you were to extract all the microbial cells out of a human and hold it in a blob in your hand, it would be a gooey mess that would be about a pound to three pounds of material. Um, so even though microbes are about on par with the number of cells as our cells, their cells are much, much smaller than ours, so their, their mass is much smaller. Um, but that mass we're starting to recognize now as another organ of the human body. And it's really only been the last 10 years or so that we've, we've been, been able to recognize this and explore this, this fact. Um, we have evolved, our entire lineage, human beings have evolved in the presence of this gut microbiome and we have outsourced a lot of the functionality of our bodies, a lot of our physiology, our ability to digest certain foods, absorb certain nutrients, and even educate our immune systems and fight off, off pathogens. So all this functionality has been outsourced to our microorganisms. And this is a really beautiful um, video of a Pseudomonas aeruginosa taken by Scott uh, Chimaliski. Uh, if you don't know Scott, he has a really beautiful coffee table book out on microbial photography. Uh, you can catch his work right now at the Harvard Museum of Natural History. There's a lot of really cool microbial photography there right now. So the human body isn't strictly human. Um, this, this, this sort of new organ that, we, that we're coming to recognize as the microbiome is part and parcel to the functionality of the whole system. And if it breaks down, if it starts to fall apart, we start to get sick. So we're like chimeras in a way. And I guess the word in the field that's come out is holobiont. We are, an or, we are a single organism that's made up of multiple species. We're not a single species necessarily. And so how does this holobiont form? Well, if you think about the evolution of human beings over the, over the course of time, for most of our evolution, we existed in some, some scenario like this. Uh, so here it looks like North America, probably like Amerindians, um, where you have a beaver, I think, being held over the fire there. But for the most part, you grew up, you're out in the field, you're in the dirt, uh, you live with your domestic animals right next to you. Um, you're, you're, the surfaces that you interact with are essentially living surfaces. And they themselves have their own microbiomes and are dispersing microbiota onto our bodies. So we're constantly and continually being exposed to non-human bacterial diversity. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm so used to just doing it manually. Um, it's fancy, all right. But now we live in big cities uh, this is Chicago, where I did my PhD. Um, and we've changed the picture quite a bit. We've changed the development of our bodies over, over, the, over time from birth to, to adulthood. We essentially enclose ourselves in these inert boxes with like glass and tile and stone. Uh, and these surfaces are not very nutritious for a microorganism, so there's not a whole lot of microbial action going on. On, on these glass walls, for example. So we're not getting much from those glass walls to, to populate the diversity of our own bodies. Um, and essentially, 
the most, the biggest source of bacteria in our environment is ourselves. So this is a, a kind of animation by, made by the Sloan Foundation, looking at a, an architect sitting in their office, um, going over some plans for a building. But as you can see, all, all these colors are sort of meant to represent the microbiome of that person. And part of my grad work was to kind of describe some of this stuff. So what we do know is when I put my hand on the table, I leave behind a bunch of oils, and those oils are inundated with, with microorganisms. And so we're constantly, this cloud, this aura of bacteria on our bodies is being dispersed uh, around us. And we're all more microbiologically similar tonight after leaving this room than we were when we walked in. Uh, so we're dispersing microbes amongst ourselves, uh, but these microbes are of human origin. These are all human bacteria, and it's sort of like a mirror. We're just sort of dispersing things onto these inert surfaces. Someone else walks by, picks up another mi microbe from a human source, and we're missing some of that environmental exposure, some of that environmental diversity that perhaps we got more of in the past. Right, so it's sort of a depauperate microbial community. I just did it again. Um, this, this mirror that's sort of focusing this depauperate community onto, our, onto ourselves over and over and over again. Uh, so, so that's one force acting on the human microbiome that is reducing its diversity over time. But there's another force coming from the other direction. Um, so in addition to this lack of exposure to diversity, we're also uh, assaulting our own microbiomes with things like antibiotics. This is penicillin. So antibiotics are incredibly important. Uh, they're, they're, they were this huge boon to medicine. They've saved, if not hundreds of millions, if not billions, hundreds of millions of lives over the past century or so. Uh, but there's this collateral damage to, micro, to, to antibiotics that we didn't quite realize before. So when you take an antibiotic like penicillin, you're not only attacking the pathogen that's infecting you, you're also depleting the microbial diversity of the good bacteria that live in your gut or on your skin. Um, so over time, over many rounds of antibiotics, you get extinction events. You're losing bacterial species. Um, our diets have shifted quite a bit from what they used to be. We used to eat a lot more complex carbohydrates, a lot more insoluble fiber. Now our diets are enriched in um, you know, processed sugar, uh, fats, proteins, uh, and it's much more homogenous. So we eat the same thing all year round instead of our, our diets varying throughout the year. And so this, this we have evidence for as a, as a force for reducing diversity. So if you go on a really low fiber diet, you start to lose species over time from your microbiome. Uh, people are obsessed with antibacterial everything. So you, if you go in the grocery store, there's antibacterial soaps. Everyone's putting on Purell. Um, and this is obviously having a, a negative impact on the good bacteria as well as the bad. So we're sort of scorching the earth whenever we, we Purell our hands to, to, to try to get rid of the, the bad bugs. Uh, not necessarily a good thing. And then finally, uh, for, for little kids, I think it's, it's very important, mostly early in life, to get the proper exposure to, to microbial diversity. And so we see you know, little kids are very protected we, we, you know, for good reason, right? They're, they're very vulnerable, but we perhaps protect them a little too much from going outside, playing in the dirt. Um, we put them in these very pristine environments. And um, another element, too, is breast milk. Uh, mother's breast milk contains microorganisms. And we know those are important inocula early in life, bifidobacteria, for example. Uh, and the milk itself contains a lot of oligosaccharides, which are these little sugars, these food molecules, that um, feed microbes. They're, they're not, they can't be digested by us. They're specifically to feed microorganisms. Um, so all of these forces from the top and from the bottom are working together to deplete the microbial diversity of our, of our system. And this seems to have had some consequences to the human population. So this is just a plot of the incidence of inflammatory bowel disease across the planet. And you can see that a lot of the industrialized nations and some of the developing nations are having much higher rates of inflammatory bowel disease. And this is pretty much true across the board for autoimmune disorders. So allergies, asthma, things like this, these are rising in frequency in the developing world. And, and the association between the rise in frequency of autoimmune disorders and the depletion of our exposure to micro microbial diversity, especially early in life, is, is called the hygiene hypothesis. This is a very popular hypothesis in the community right now. It's not a proven thing. Um, there's a lot of other reasons why developing nations might have environments that would 
um, promote some phenotype like autoimmunity that's not related to the microbiome, but there's a lot of studies now showing that there does appear to be an association. So we're just, we're just starting to dig into that now. I'll give you a quick anecdote on one of these studies that the, the British guy you saw in the video, Jack, was involved in. So this is the Amish and the Hutterites. These are two uh, religious groups. They're both derived from Germany originally. Um, the Amish, I think, are more east coast, midwest, and the Hutterites are, are out west. So this picture here is, is in Montana, my home state of the Hutterites. The main differences between these groups are, is that the Amish kind of shun technology. They don't use cars or tractors or anything like that. And that really forces them to, not forces them, but they, they end up using their children more for labor when they're younger in, in, the, in the barnyard. So they're out milking cows, they're out working in the dirt. Whereas the Hutterites, they have mechanized agriculture. And the kids don't really get out and start, and start working in the, in the barnyard until they're teens. So we have a clear example of a control for genetic diversity, but differential environments growing up. Oops, I'll just do that. Uh, so I apologize for having some data and some plots, but uh, this top plot here is just uh, uh, essentially showing the genetic diversity of different populations. And the proximity between two points is the similarity, genetic similarity between people. Each point is a person. And in the middle there, there's a cluster of uh, blue and red triangles, and those are the Amish and the Hutterites. So essentially, they fall right on top of each other in genetic space. And environmentally, if you go and measure in, in their homes how, much, how many allergens they have around their house, the Amish homes have many more allergens, bacterial aller allergens, animal allergens. Uh, and the Hutterites are much cleaner, have much, much fewer allergens. Um, and you might think that um, that would actually lead to more asthma in the Amish community, but it's actually counterintuitively that the Amish children have very low incidence of, of asthma, and you see a higher incidence of asthma in Hutterite children. This was a pretty small cohort, but the result was still significant, and a few other follow-up studies have found similar type, type things. Um, okay, so back to our survey. Um, so now I'm gonna just do a... <laughs> A very non-scientific uh, uh, analysis here of the data we collected tonight. Um, but before I get into it, um, since we have such low numbers, we had to use a statistical test that is focused on, on small number statistics. And I know it's always like dangerous to, to talk about statistics in, a, in like a public science talk. I don't want to like bore you all. But I think this is a cool story to, to focus in on. Um, this is Fisher, who came up with this thing called the Fisher exact test. Uh, Fisher is a notorious, uh, uh, he's, well, he's not known for being a very nice person. And uh, he was at tea one day in Cambridge, uh, and a lady was getting her tea from the, the server, and she sent it back and said, no, this, this won't do. The, the milk went into the cup first, and then the tea went second. You can't, that, that's, that's not how you do English tea. And I can taste the difference. And Fisher said, no, oh, that's BS. You can't taste the difference. And so he devised a test to be able to tell whether or not she was full of it. Um, for tasting the difference between these two types of, 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 of ways of serving tea. So the experiment that he came up with is you have eight cups of tea. Uh, in half of them, the milk goes in first and the tea goes in second, and then the other half goes the other way around. And then they randomize them and set them out on the table, and then the lady has to come out and guess which one is which. Um, and the reason he chose eight is if you do the, the sort of probabilities, the chance of her choosing all four correctly is a one out of all 70 possible scenarios, which is like 0.014 or 1.4% chance that she's yeah. right by dumb luck, which is pretty low odds, right? So she, she's probably right if she guesses all four. And she did actually guess all four. So she, 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 she got it right. She got, she, got, she got it right. So Fisher couldn't prove her wrong. He wanted to do a follow-up experiment, but, uh, but she, I don't think she wanted to do that. Um, okay, so I'm going to quickly run our data through his test. Ugh, not significant. Oh, well. That's the problem with small number statistics. But, you know, you do enough of those studies, and uh, over time, you build a consensus, and uh, we'll come to an answer. So I'll, I'll, I'll tick that down as a no, and maybe the next time it'll be a yes. We'll see. Uh, okay, so moving on. So if, if the hygiene hypothesis is true, uh, one big thing that we should focus on is conserving all this genetic diversity that we perhaps are losing in industrialized countries. So this is the Svalbard Seed Bank in uh, Svalbard, Sweden. It's an island off north of Sweden. And all these countries have put their seeds into this, into this seed bank um, in case there's a war or, or some sort of natural disaster, and then they can go back and get their crops from, from this vault. And so what we want to do uh, in the Alm Lab is to create a similar type of seed bank for human microbial diversity. 
So there's a great French guy in the group named Mathieu Grussin, uh, working with my advisor, Eric, and they've devised this plan to go sample all these indigenous populations across the entire planet. Um, they've already gone to, to these places, so they've sampled the Northern Cheyenne people in Montana, the Inuit in Northern Canada, the Sami people in Finland, and the Hadza hunters in Central Africa. Uh, and there's, there's many other places they, they're, they're planning to go. Um, and so this is an active, active thing where they're trying to just go out, get, get live stool, get it back to MIT, actually grow living organisms from that, freeze them, put them in the freezer, and now, now they're banked and accessible in perpetuity. And this is, they're still trying to raise funds for this, so if anybody's interested in, in contributing to a good cause, let me know afterwards and I can get you hooked up with Matthew. So I'm gonna end off with a final sort of anecdote. I'm not sure what I'm doing on time here. Am I good? Okay. Uh, you can think of the, the gut as this vibrant ecosystem. It's, it's an organ, but it's a, it's a strange kind of organ because it's made up of many different species that are all interacting and competing and, 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 and doing all these things on their own. Um, but you know, when it's healthy, it's, it's great. Our bodies work just fine. But when it's not healthy, when something bad happens, there's a chance that uh, the weeds come in, right? Um, oftentimes, when you take antibiotics or when you do have a, a forest fire go through your gut, you bounce back. Uh, the gut microbiome is pretty resilient, and so for the most part, people bounce back. But every now and then, you don't bounce back. And so a good example of not bouncing back is Clostridium difficile infections. Uh, and if you haven't heard of C. diff, Clostridium difficile, this is the second most common um, uh, hospital-acquired infection in the U.S. Uh, it was, I think, a couple of years ago, responsible for about 30,000 deaths each year in the U.S. I think now it's actually come down to about 15,000 because of the things that I'm going to describe in a little bit here. Um, but, but essentially, C, C. diff is a disease that comes when you destroy the native ecology of your gut, and it is then able to come in as a weed, grow it, and establish, make a really inflamed environment, and prevent the reestablishment of your native microbiota. Uh, most people who get C. diff, they'll go to the doctor, they get vancomycin, and 70% of them will recover. So vancomycin works for about 70% of people. That remaining 30%, though, if it doesn't work, uh, then you get into to trouble. So then you get what's called recurrent C. difficile that keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. Um, and there's not much hope that antibiotics will do much after that point. Uh, and this is where people end up dying, is you, you get these really systemic infections that, that go on for, for perhaps years. You damage the intestine so much that you have to actually cut out a section of it, and then you can get sepsis and all these other complications from that surgery. So this was, is this was really affecting the quality of life of a lot of people in this country. Um, but, but very recently, we figured out that if you just take healthy poop from a, a person and inject it into per, a person who has a C. diff infection, um, you can pretty much cure them overnight. No need for any other drugs, any other antibiotics. It's sort of an ecosystem transplant from a healthy person into a sick person. Um, and it's, it's sort of a, a miracle cure in a way, and it's, it's the basis of why there's so much um, excitement and funding moving into the microbiome space as a, as a new branch of healthcare because this, this really, really does seem to work. So I'll give you a quick um, visual example of how this is working. This is a video produced by the, um, by the Knight Lab, Rob Knight, who's a big um, researcher in my field. And what we're seeing here is a plot. Every, every dot is a sample taken from someone's microbiome. And the distance between dots is how similar their, the ecological structure of those microbial communities are. And the data is coming from the Human Microbiome Project, which is a project that sequenced about 300 people from around the US uh, from different environments on their bodies. So I think pretty soon you'll start seeing lit up. You have the skin, you have the vagina, and you have the gut. And it's very clear that these different environments cluster very separately on this map. Any minute now. <laughs> oh, there we go. Skin, oral, oral, vaginal, and gut. OK, so that's where you should be if you have a gut microbiome sample. However, when you see these red stars, these are people that have recurrent C. diff infections. So their gut microbiomes look almost like skin. They're just kind of way off the map. The little yellow star is a healthy person, a healthy fecal donor. And they're going to donate their stool to these other people. And you're going to be able to watch a time series of what happens to those sick people's microbiomes um, after the transplant. And essentially, it's kind of almost boring in a sense. It's, it's, it's overnight a very rapid drop to the healthy state, the healthy gut state, and then they stay there, and they don't get sick again. Um, it's very, very, very effective. Da, da, da. 
and I got have my joke. Okay. Um, so you know, fecal transplants sound silly, uh, but actually, it's like saving people's lives, making people better. It's a it's a serious thing. Um, so the the final anecdote I'll end off on is to talk a bit about uh, work out of my advisor's lab, Eric Alm, uh, the company Open Biome. You may have seen these ads in the subway or around town on buses. Uh, so you can actually sign up and become a fecal donor for uh, fecal transplants. It's a very rigorous screening process. They, they joke that it's harder to get into the open biome donor cohort than it is to get into MIT. I think it's only about one or three percent uh, of people actually ma make the screening. Um, so, so the origin of this, of this nonprofit company is that Mark Smith, uh, a graduate student in Eric's group, um, a few years ago, his cousin came to him saying he had recurrent C. diff infection and he couldn't get access to a fecal transplant um, because back then it was very difficult to find a hospital and find a doctor who would perform the, 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 the procedure. And the reason it was so difficult for doctors is, first of all, the FDA wasn't so excited about it. It sounded icky and dirty and, and bad. Doc, the culture of doctors hadn't quite come to a point where people were really accepting of it. Um, but there were a few people who did it, and, and what you had to do is you had to find a healthy donor to match with your sick person. You had to screen them very, very rigorously and make sure they have no known pathogens in their system. Uh, most of us carry some pathogen something, but we're, we're fine because our native microbiota protect us from it. But you can't just be giving that to someone else who's in a really depleted state. So you have to find these pristine people. Um, so his cousin couldn't find anybody to do this for him, and he ended up doing an at-home DIY fecal transplant with a blender and, and some poop from his friend in a, in a enema. Um, and so Mark was horrified by this, the fact that, that these, you couldn't get access to this procedure that we knew worked, um, and you had to do these dangerous at-home type things. And so they started this company, and they, and they recruit these healthy donors who can come back over and over and over again and keep giving samples. And they can make these big batches of their material uh, into these really kind of homogenized uh, units. They're now um, packaging this into crapsules, crapsules, I think they're calling them, or frozen poop pills. And they work pretty much just as well as the traditional uh, sort of colonoscopy or enema method of, of applying this, this treatment. So you pop. Uh, eight or nine of these pills every day for three or four days, and uh, it takes care of your C. diff. Uh, and they're shipping this out to hospitals all over the country now, so no matter where you live around the country, you can probably get access to this, uh, to this treatment because there should be a doctor that has this material in the freezer. Um, so it's just a, a really amazing example of how our field has contributed to healthcare, um, and I think this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there are literally hundreds of associations between human health and changes in our microbiome. Uh, a lot of that is probably just association and correlation, but even if just 1% one, one or 10% of them are real or causal, uh, that's really going to kind of be a game changer for medicine. And I would guess that in 10 years or so, you probably will start to see MDs who are actually speci specializing in the microbiome as, as a sort of medical specialty. Um, so yeah, the final image is this, this art piece by Sonia, Sonia Bemel, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Um, she just laid her arm on an on a auger pad and watched what microbes grew up from her arm. So just remember, you know, we're, we're all covered in this protective layer of bacteria. It's not a scary, icky thing. It's actually quite good for us and, and quite necessary. Uh, and you should take care of your microbiome so it'll take care of you. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. Uh, hi. So uh, given all that you know about uh, the microbiome, how has it changed how you live your life? Ah, I get that question a lot. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, like I said, there's a, there are a lot of associations and there's not a lot of actionable intelligence on exactly what to do. Um, I try to uh, take fewer antibiotics if possible. Um, I, I'm careful about how I do that. Um, uh, I think the one lesson that can be learned is that fiber is always good. I think you can always eat more fiber. You know, I think your grandmother was right. Leafy greens are, are good for you. So eat as, eat as much of your leafy greens and your fruits and vegetables as possible. Um, Diet-wise, uh, otherwise, it's, it's much harder because there's now a few studies showing that um, one person can eat a uh, banana and they have like an almost pre-diabetic response to it. Another person can eat it and they, it lo they look totally healthy. And the same could be true for a bowl of ice cream. 
So it seems there's a very personalized nature to um, our nutrition and our health based on diet. And that also seems to be linked to the microbiome, but we, we haven't teased all that apart yet. Does the gut biome vary um, significantly by either race or gender? Ooh, it's a good question. Um, it doesn't vary by gender at all that I've ever noticed. I've never seen a significant variation in the gut by gender. Um, by race, I don't think there's strong evidence that it varies by race. Maybe very, in very minor ways occasionally. There's certain genetic, um, like hypertension and things like that are, are more prevalent in certain racial groups than others. Uh, and that can, that can trickle down to the structure of the microbiome. But, it, but I think in broad strokes, there's not very strong differences along racial lines. It's more ethnic or cultural lines. So for example, the Hadza hunters in Africa, they look very distinct. They have a lot of Prevotella in their guts, a lot of kind of fiber degraders in their systems. Um, but people of, this, of a similar genetic lineage living in the US, they look like anyone else living in the US. So environment seems to be the, the important driver there. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm doing some work right now around antibiotic resistance and looking a little bit to the space. Do you have other organizations outside of Open Biome that you think are making big strides in terms of how to apply this science to preventing antibiotic resistance? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, that's not my area of expertise. I'm, I think I'm more of an ecologist uh, and not like a strict medical microbiologist, but there are myriad companies that are starting up right now around the microbiome. Um, but I can't tell you about anything on the antibiotic resistance side of things. I know there's a lot of work in that area, but I'm not sure. Uh, this may be outside of the scope of your expertise, um, but I work in a medical practice where a physician practices microbi um, microbiome medicine. I don't. Um, what are your thoughts about the, the diagnostic testing and then the treatment, two very different things. The direct-to-consumer diagnostic testing in some cases, and certainly the direct-to-consumer treatments. Are you talking about the companies that have spun up or? Well, just more, more the testing from a microbiome, the bacteria perspective. Um, mm -hmm. Have you looked at them? Are they valid? Are they specific and sensitive? And then, and then the treatment modalities, specifying uh, probiotics, which probiotics are needed. Because this is being done yes. uh, progressively here. Right. Um, what do you think about it? Well, I, I would say there's a lot of snake oil out there. Um, <laughs> So we gotta be careful, like probiotics are completely unregulated. Um, when I was in Jack's lab, we went to, the, went to Whole Foods, bought a bunch of probiotics and then sequenced who was there. Um, and it didn't match, half the time it didn't match what was on the label. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a very unregulated market, probiotics. There are people developing what, what are called microbial therapeutics, and they're supposed to be more kind of pharmaceutical grade probiotics that are actually going through phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials. And so those are going to be more expensive, but they're probably going to be much more reliable. In general, though, probiotics do help with certain things. So it seems like a lot, there's a lot of probiotics that do help a lot with diarrhea. So if you have diarrhea, there's a good chance probiotics will help you out. Um, for a lot of other stuff, it's really hit and miss and really um, contextual, whether or not something works and whether it doesn't. Uh, and I don't think anyone knows for sure. There's no easy answer to that. Um, as far as diagnostics go, I just uh, completed a meta-analysis with a great grad student, Claire Duvalet, and, and Eric's group, where we looked at um, associations between disease and the microbiome across multiple diseases. And what we found that was interesting is about, for a given pair of diseases, about half of the associations you find between health and disease uh, for these two different diseases, say, say I don't know, um, colorectal cancer and, and IBD, um, half of those associations are shared across diseases. So I think we gotta be careful with diagnostics that may not be necessarily diagnostic for a very specific disease. Even though in a, in a single study, you might find that association, that association might be indicative of many things that are, that are associated with other diseases as well. Um, the only disease I know of that has a pretty strong, um, reliable, predictive association that I would sort of believe is colorectal cancer. Uh, I think that there's um, a suite of organisms that are very, predictive of someone having colorectal cancer. Uh, and I think more will come out, but I think a lot of work needs to be done still to figure that out. Just wondering, uh, are there any uh, psychological impacts of an imbalance in the gut microbiome? For sure. Uh, that's a huge area of research. The gut-brain axis, which was what the, the clip was telling us about, right? Sarkis, Masmanian, and, and Jack were talking about it. 
Um, yes, there are several very well-known cases where it, 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 is, it for sure does. So there's a disease in little kids called pandas. Have you heard of this? I like to talk about this one. It just blows my mind a little bit. Uh, some kids get strep throat, but they don't exhibit a sore throat at all. They exhibit obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and you can cure that obsessive compulsive disorder with antibiotics. That's, that's, that's one particular example. Um, but there are many other associations that have been found uh, in that space. Um, there's been some clinical trials in Europe showing that lactobacillus rhamnosus, which is a common probiotic, can kind of mildly um, improve depression symptoms in patients. Um, I think it's a rich space that we're going to find a lot of, about in the next few years. But a lot of the associations, again, haven't been nailed down as causal, except for pandas. With the fecal, trans with the fecal transplants, um, I, my thought about it is when, when blood transfusion um, first, w first began, we, we weren't aware that you could transmit you know, things like hep C and different viruses. As a microbiologist, could you, can you foresee any kind of red flags in the transplant? That's a really good question, and that's part of the reason the FDA is, is very um, uncomfortable with fecal transplants and why there's, a, there's this huge push by companies now to create smaller cocktails of very specific bugs that you can use that will do the same job as the whole stool transplant. Uh, they do very rigorous screening. They look for all known pathogens. But um, back to colorectal cancer, for example, uh, we know that Fusobacterium is associated with uh, tumors, colorectal tumors. Uh, whether or not they are causally influential on tumorigenesis, that is less known. And there's some evidence that possibly they are. But these organisms are not um, screened for in the, in the donors. So you know, it, it is possible that getting a transplant from someone may increase the abundance of, a, of an organism that in the long term, maybe 20, 30 years down the line, could slightly increase your, your odds of getting cancer. Um, but I think most folks have sort of turned their heads and, and said, well, if you're, if you're going to die of C. diff in the next couple of years, let's just treat the person and, and, and get, them, get them better. I actually wanted to follow up on the study you were doing earlier uh, with this group. Um, what, uh, w when you have a larger sample size, um, what, what is the connection that you see between the method of birth um, and um, allergy resistance? So there have been multiple studies showing an association between um, C-section birth and, and um, natural birth and a higher prevalence of asthma and allergies later in life. I think at least three or four studies have, have shown something like that in, in different size cohorts. Uh, there's one study that, that showed no association, but only in preterm babies. So I guess with preterm babies, um, uh, you're already a little um, weird at your onset because of that, because of that perturbations, and so perhaps that, that wipes the slate clean a bit. But um, there are several studies showing that that association exists. And that, assess, that association is also paired with uh, a, a change in the microbiome. So it, seem, it seems to be that kids that were born via C-section for the first year of their life, they lack a very important group of organisms called Bacteroidetes in their, in their gut system. Uh, whereas kids that are vaginally born um, have that organism in their, in their gut for that first year of life. And that might be very important in training your immune system and teaching it not to be too sensitive, not to be tuned up too high. So a follow up to that, uh, are C-section children now basically inoculated with vaginal fluids somehow? Yes, uh, there are folks doing this. Uh, again, I think this makes regula regulators nervous. But um, there, there are parents, there are certain hospitals and doctors that, that, have, that are providing the service where you can place a gauze pad in the mother's vagina prior to birth. And then after the child is extracted, then they're kind of swabbed down with, with those secretions. Um, it seems like a pretty good idea. I, but, uh, but who knows? It, the, somebody, if one kid gets sick, then, then the whole thing kind of falls apart. So um, yeah. I mean, there, there, there are other issues too, right? So sometimes they give prophylactic antibiotics to, to mothers who are harboring a particular microbe in their gut. And um, this, is, this has been associated with, so, so certain kids that are vaginally born, their gut microbiomes look very similar to C-section born kids. And there seems to be association between that and having your mother on antibiotics prior to birth. <laughs> Great, cool. Um, well, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. And thank you, Sean, for being here and speaking to us. Thank you.